Can taking dietary vitamins and supplements help treat symptoms of COVID-19? The truth is that some may help and some really don't show very much evidence at all. There is a new report available and I'm going to share it with you today. Many of us started taking supplements and different vitamins when COVID-19 started. And there was the argument that why are officials not discussing this more? Why are we not being told to take certain vitamins, take certain supplements and get out and get some exercise and maybe some sunshine to help increase our vitamin D levels? And all of this certainly has its place. However, as pharmacists, we really need to see the evidence for indicating a certain vitamin or supplement before we can recommend it. So this is a report that is looking at the evidence to date of different vitamins and supplements studied throughout the pandemic for the treatment of COVID-19. So we're going to go over them together and see what the evidence is to date. This report, Dietary Supplements and OTC Products Used During COVID-19, was published in Pharmacy Today. I cannot take credit for this report and some of the text from this report that I'm sharing with you is actually direct copy from the report. And so I must give them credit for this report. In the six weeks before April 5th of 2020, the first wave of the pandemic in the US, sales of dietary supplements increased 44%, that's $435 million, relative to the same period the previous year. In March of 2020 alone, almost 120 million units of vitamins and supplements were sold. A reminder that this video is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be a replacement for seeking care from a healthcare professional. Making any changes to your medications or supplements can have adverse outcomes. Many medications and supplements can interact with each other and cause undesirable outcomes, so please do not make any changes to your medications or supplements without consulting with your healthcare provider first. How many supplements do you take on a daily basis? Let me know in the comments. This can include multivitamins, uh, different supplements, anything that you take daily. Let me know in the comments how many you take and what they are. So dietary supplements do not undergo the same review process as conventional drugs. This is true for the US and it's also true for Canada. These products are not required to have robust clinical data demonstrating their safety or effectiveness. And once a dietary supplement is marketed, the FDA has the responsibility of showing that a product is unsafe before it can take action to restrict the product's use or removal from the marketplace. And for Canada, the process is quite similar. As of February of 2022, there are over 200 postings on clinicaltrials.gov for studies evaluating the use of various dietary supplements for COVID-19. Before we talk about the specific vitamins, many of you will know that vitamins are classified according to their solubility. We have water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. So the water-soluble vitamins you see here, and they are quite easily removed from the body. Usually they are eliminated through the urine. And then fat-soluble vitamins are vitamins that can actually build up and they tend to be stored in the adipose or fat tissue in the body. And these are the vitamins that can be a little bit more dangerous as far as building up in the body. However, water-soluble vitamins, if taken in high doses, can also cause problems. And that is not the purpose of this video, but watch for future videos because I will be covering some of these um, vitamins in the future. Vitamin C. Let's go over a little bit of what vitamin C does, and then we'll look at the evidence for COVID-19. Vitamin C is otherwise known as ascorbic acid. It is a water-soluble vitamin and it is thought to have beneficial effects in patients with severe illnesses, including serious infections and sepsis. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. It is a free radical scavenger and it does have anti-inflammatory properties. It has been shown to influence cellular immunity and vascular integrity, and it is involved in the formation of collagen. It is also involved in the formation of hemoglobin, and erythrocyte red blood cell maturation. So vitamin C has a very important role in the body and we can get vitamin C from a lot of citrus, fruits and vegetables. The COVID A to Z trial evaluated the use of zinc and ascorbic acid in adult ambulatory patients with COVID-19 infections. 
214 patients were randomized to take 10 day treatments of 50 milligrams of zinc gluconate at bedtime, 8,000 milligrams, which is a very high dose of ascorbic acid, divided over two to three times per day with meals, both agents or their unmodified routine. Patients in the usual care group who did not receive supplementation achieved a 50% reduction in symptoms at a mean of 6.7 days compared with 5.5 days for the ascorbic acid group, 5.9 days for the zinc gluconate group, and 5.5 days for the group that received both supplements. We will be speaking about zinc in a moment. So these results suggest that zinc, ascorbic acid, or a combination of both do not affect COVID-19 related symptoms. I am just the messenger here. Please do not judge. I am just giving you the evidence that we have to date. We do have some evidence that vitamin C sometimes can help reduce the duration of a cold, although even that is controversial. I do take vitamin, D, vitamin C myself sometimes, uh, but this is the evidence that we have right now. So the trial also assessed the number of days required to reach a 50% reduction in symptoms, including severity of fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue. However, the study was stopped early and no significant difference was observed among the four groups. So currently the National Institute of Health COVID-19 treatment guidelines note that there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of vitamin C in the treatment of COVID-19. Here is the recommended dietary allowance of vitamin C. And vitamin C does appear to be safe at intakes up to 2000 milligrams a day for most adults. However, vitamin C does have some drug-drug interactions and this is pulled right from the compendium for pharmaceutical specialties. You can see that it does interact with some things. And so even vitamin C itself, there is some caution to be warranted especially if you are taking this on a daily basis or in higher doses, best to speak with your pharmacist or physician before adding this to your routine. Zinc is a trace mineral that may increase polymorphonuclear cells ability to fight infection. Intracellular zinc concentrations have been shown to impair replication in a number of RNA viruses. Now adverse effects of taking zinc. Zinc has been shown to cause a metallic taste dry mouth, and gastrointestinal intolerance at high doses. Ascorbic acid can also cause gastrointestinal intolerance, especially in high doses. The use of zinc in ambulatory adult patients with COVID-19 did not result in improved outcomes compared with the standard of care. NIH guidelines note that the recommended dietary allowance for elemental zinc is 11 milligrams daily for men and eight milligrams for non-pregnant women, and the doses used in clinical trials have been much higher. So a randomized study looked at 191 patients from three academic medical centers with COVID-19 infection. These patients were randomized to take zinc sulfate 220 milligrams, which is 50 milligrams of elemental zinc twice daily, plus hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine alone for five days. They found no difference between the two treatment groups. Specifically, no differences were observed with respect to recovery within 28 days the need for mechanical ventilation or death. A single center retrospective study. 242 patients were hospitalized with COVID-19. They were treated with zinc and they failed to find a mortality benefit in those who received the zinc supplementation of 440 milligrams per day, equivalent to 100 milligrams of elemental zinc compared with those who did not. Vitamin D. We know that vitamin D has immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory properties. Vitamin D helps the body absorb and retain calcium and phosphorus and thus helps to strengthen our bones. Laboratory studies have shown that vitamin D can reduce cancer cell growth and help control infections and reduce inflammation. There is also evidence that vitamin D can help with mood and depression. So there was a multi-center double-blind placebo-controlled trial conducted in two sites in Sao Paulo, Brazil that evaluated the use of high-dose vitamin D for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. The primary outcome of this study was a reduction in the length of stay. No significant difference in the median length of stay between the vitamin D3 and placebo groups was observed. No significant differences were observed between the two groups in the percentages of patients who were admitted to the ICU, those who required mechanical ventilation, 
or those who died during hospitalization. The NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines note that there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of vitamin D in the treatment of COVID-19. A similar statement was given about vitamin C. For normal healthy adults, Health Canada recommends a total intake of 600 international units of vitamin D up to age 70 and 800 international units after age 70. Now, Osteoporosis Canada suggests that adults at risk of osteoporosis can take 400 to 2,000 units of vitamin D per day. A quick note about high doses of vitamin D. Vitamin D, as you'll remember, is a fat-soluble vitamin and can build up in the body. This study was looking at vitamin D in relation to bone health. They actually dosed patients with a few different doses of vitamin D, and the highest dose they were giving was 10,000 units, and I believe that was daily. They noted that there was actually a decrease in bone density with higher doses of vitamin D. Omega-3 fatty acids are polyunsaturated fatty acids. These include EPA and DHA. The main food sources of EPA and DHA are fatty fish and fish oil. Omega-3s may have beneficial effects on the immune system of patients with viral infections. Higher intakes and blood levels of EPA and DHA may be associated with lower levels of inflammatory cytokines. So a double-blind randomized study looked at 128 critically ill patients infected with COVID-19. Supplementation with omega-3 resulted in significantly higher one-month survival rates and better improvements in select blood chemistry assessments compared to those in the control group. It's very interesting. We also have a single blind study in 30 patients hospitalized with COVID-19. Supplementation with omega-3 in addition to hydroxychloroquine resulted in favorable changes in most clinical symptoms compared to with hydroxychloroquine alone. So here we're seeing that omega-3 is showing some benefit and hydroxychloroquine is not. If you're enjoying this video and finding it valuable, please give it a like and subscribe. I really appreciate your support. Melatonin is a hormone produced by the pineal gland in the brain that helps to regulate circadian rhythms. We all produce melatonin on a daily basis. Melatonin appears to have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. If you haven't seen my video yet on melatonin and anxiety, you can look at that video. I'll put the link up here. So 74 hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. These patients were randomized to standard of care plus melatonin, three milligrams, three times a day for 14 days, or the standard of care alone. A total of 24 patients of the melatonin group and 20 patients in the control group completed the study. The results showed that clinical symptoms such as cough, dyspnea, and fatigue, as well as pulmonary involvement, significantly improved in the melatonin group compared with the control group. In another study, we have 158 patients with severe COVID-19. Melatonin 10 milligrams, in addition to the standard of care, had less frequently developed thrombosis or sepsis compared with the standard of care alone. Mortality was also significantly higher in the control group. When used as a sleep aid supplement, melatonin appears to be safe for short-term use at doses of up to 10 milligrams a day. However, melatonin does cause drowsiness and it does come with its own list of precautions. So please ask a healthcare professional before adding or changing any supplements or medications, including melatonin. In the interest of time, I will not be going over what the report talks about in regards to echinacea, probiotics, and kerastatin. However, I would encourage you to go and look at the report, which will be, will be linked in the description of this video. It is very interesting that probiotics actually did show some good evidence for use, specifically in helping to reduce gastrointestinal and digestive issues like diarrhea during COVID-19, because we know that that can be a significantly distressing symptom of COVID-19. So I would encourage you to go and have a look at that if you are interested. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe with notifications for future videos. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.